I've been praying for you all week that, that those that would come would fight through the sleepiness of Sunday. You'd fight your kids all the way to church just so that you didn't miss church because I believe God has a word for you today. In fact, if you are at home and you're watching through our online platform, wherever you are, I believe God has a word for you today. In fact, if you're, listen, this word is not just, just for today. If you go through our archives a year from now and you're, you're, at, you're getting a pedicure and you watch this word, God is going to speak to you. Listen, let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me speak to you prophetically for a moment. For those of you who are so shaken in your life that you are worn out. For those of you who are going through trials and all you are left with is questions. For those of you who are going through difficulty right now and you can't make a way and you can't figure out why things are the way they are today, the spirit of the living God is going to refresh your spirit and give to you a breakthrough that you've been needing. Somebody go ahead and praise him for that mm. so 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 turn with me to the narrative turn with me to the narrative Daniel chapter 1 verses 1 through 21 I'm gonna read part of this narrative and then we're gonna pause to establish where we're going just remain standing for the reading and and honoring God's word let me just read a few verses is that okay is that all right? Listen, here we go. Here, here's what's happening in the book of Daniel, chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put into the treasure house of his God. Verse 3, then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. Verse 5, the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Verse 6 says, among those were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. The chief official gave to them new names. To Daniel, he gave him the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. For all practical purposes, here is Daniel going through difficulty, trials. The worst situation that you could ever imagine brokenness for all practical purposes he is a prisoner of war in a foreign land he is a POW and Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians what they are trying to do is rob the people of Israel of their identity they're trying to eradicate a, a way of life a people the people of God the people of Israel but in verse 8 we get the title for this series, but we also see the mindset of Daniel. Here's what it says. Keep in mind, he's going through all of these difficulties. He's been marched from his homeland. He's living now in, in a, another place that's not his own. His name has been changed. All of these things are happening. And then in verse 8, it says, but Daniel, somebody say, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and the wine and he asked the chief official permission not to defile himself this way hold on a second but Daniel what I love about this passage of scripture is that we see something in Daniel's resolve it says but Daniel resolves three words but Daniel resolved but Daniel resolved hold on a second but Daniel resolved when all of hell was breaking out in Daniel's life when everything was shaken around him his fate was unshakable 
In fact, look at your neighbor and give to them the title of this series, Unshakable. Touch somebody else and say, Unshakable. Over the next few weeks, we're going to look at the book of Daniel, the life of Daniel. When things were breaking out and falling apart all around him, he had this unshakable faith. And that unshakable faith exposed the faithfulness of God. How many of you know that God is a faithful God? In fact, the psalmist writes, I will not fear even though the earth gives way and the mountains shake because there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God and the Lord Almighty reigns. Somebody ought to praise him for that. But it's at the very top of this narrative, before verse 1, the title of this narrative is where we get our title for today's message. It says, Daniel's Training in Babylon. Somebody look at your neighbor and give to them the title of today's message. It's Training Day. Touch your other neighbor and say, you look good, but it's time to train. Look at somebody else and say, you look good, but it's time to train. You can be seated. So let me set this up for you. And then we'll come back to the text. Nebuchadnezzar, this is roughly 600 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. He's gone down to Egypt. He's taken his army. He's destroyed the army of Egypt and the Pharaoh. He now is going back home to Babylon and instead he goes through Israel, stops in Jerusalem, ransacks Jerusalem, destroys people, destroys the temple, de destroys a way of life because the king of Judah had befriended the, the Pharaoh in Egypt and so he's destroying everything he takes the most precious of their artifacts and takes them back to Babylon he takes the strongest and the brightest people with him back to Babylon in order to destroy their future in order to change their identity Nebuchadnezzar is this incredible tactician he does this for two reasons. Number one, he does it so they will not rebuild Israel. But the second reason why he does it is because he's showing everyone in the world, this is what happens when you revolt against Babylonian law. Now he has all of these prisoners, if you will, back in Babylon. And now he's beginning to dictate to them what they'll eat. He's telling them what they can and cannot eat. And here's what's funny. It's not a bad diet. It's a good diet. In fact, it's his diet. It's the royal diet. He's telling them what they can, what they cannot eat. He's trying to change their identity. He's taking them out of their land, placing them in Babylon. He's telling them this is the way you eat. This is the way you think. He's training them, robbing them of the identity that God had given to them. They're no longer to be seen as the children of God, the nation of God, the descendants of Abraham. But now they're to be seen totally different. In fact, he even changes their names. He's changing their identity so much that now he's even going to the core of who they are and giving them a Babylonian name, getting rid of their Hebrew name to Daniel, who, who means who, that, that means God is my judge. He changes that Hebrew name to a Babylonian name, Belteshazzar. He changes Hananiah's name, which means God loves me, to Shadrach. He changes Mishal to Meshach. He changes Azariah to Abednego. And he's doing this for one simple reason, a total indoctrination of a Babylonian way of life. 
He's changing their identity from the inside out. He's saying, you are no longer an Israelite. You are now a Babylonian. You no longer have that Hebrew name. You now have a Babylonian name. You no longer should see yourself as a child of God. No longer look to God. But now I want you to look to me. So why all of this training? Why all of this food? Why all of this name change? Because he's trying to change their identity. He's feeding them something. He's trying to change them, if you will, from the inside out. It's an identity shift. No longer look to God for your needs, but rather look to Nebuchadnezzar for everything that you need. And the more that I thought about that, isn't that how the enemy works? The enemy wants to feed you stuff that makes you lose who you are in God so that he can begin to dictate who he wants you to be. He begins to give you a diet full of stuff that changes your identity so that you begin to think about who he says you are and you lose the word that God has spoken over you to whom he said you are. Here is his, it's Daniel. Here, think about this with me for a moment. This is how the enemy works. The enemy will, will take your situation and make that your identity. The enemy will remind you of the most difficult parts of your life, and he will try to convince you by feeding you a bunch of garbage that that is who you are. So you'll begin to listen to what he's saying, and you'll take up identity in that divorce. You'll take up identity in that difficulty. You'll take up identity in that brokenness. And pretty soon, that becomes your identity rather than the word that God has spoken over your life. And so Daniel... In verse 8, he gives us a mindset. He gives us his mindset. He tells us something. It says in verse 8, but Daniel resolved in his heart. Grab this. But Daniel resolved in his heart. Daniel is showing us something here. And what we read is important. What we see is important in verse 8, but it's what you don't see that's really important. It does not say, but Belteshazzar. Daniel is writing this book. His name has been changed. He no longer has an Hebrew name, Daniel. He has a Babylonian name, Belteshazzar. But it does not say Belteshazzar resolved. Why? Because he does not see himself in the image of Nebuchadnezzar. He sees himself in the image of God. Therefore, he is not Belteshazzar. He is now Daniel. You're, you're not hearing what I'm saying. What I'm trying to show you is that Nebuchadnezzar could take Daniel out of Israel, but he could not get Israel out of Daniel. Daniel said, my name's not Belteshazzar. That's who the enemy is trying to tell me that I am. My name is Daniel, judged by God, which means only God can dictate and decide and design my future. But psychology tells us that if we stay oppressed by a certain power or a certain influence long enough, we'll take up identity in that. That's why you see people who are kidnapped and after they've been kidnapped for such a long period of time, they begin to take up identity. This, this, th they begin to depend upon their kidnapper, if you will. In fact, they begin to have compassion for the person who's been doing them harm. You can stay under that influence or that power long enough and pretty soon that confinement that they've placed you within will begin to dictate to you who you are and you'll take up identity in that addiction. You'll take up identity in that difficulty. You'll take up identity in that insecurity. It happens to all of us. We begin to eat the garbage of the enemy, so to speak, and what the enemy is saying to us, and pretty soon we begin to digest it and believe it, and it becomes our identity. It happens to all of us. You know what the enemy's chief strategy is? The enemy wants to change your name to your situation so that you'll trade the name of your creator in whose image you were created in. Grab that. The enemy wants to 
change your name to your situation, Belteshazzar, so that you will trade the name of your creator in whose image you were created in. Lord, have mercy, that's good. Can I take a moment and build on that? I need some help. Is somebody going to help me preach? I prayed for you to get rid of that sleepiness of Sunday all week long, and some of y'all are still sleepy. Wipe the sleep out your eyes, and let's get with it. Daniel, the reason why Daniel, I suggest to you, said, but Daniel resolved, is because he did not see himself in the image of Nebuchadnezzar. He saw himself in the image of God. In fact, Daniel was in this place of isolation, and during the isolation, Daniel received a revelation. And just the opposite in our lives many times, when we're going through difficulty, we don't see the revelation of God in our lives. But Daniel did. It says in verse 8, it says, but Daniel resolved in his heart. But verse 9 shows us something. Look at verse 9. Here's what verse 9 says. Verse 9 says, put it up for me. It says, now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. Now God had showed, caused the official to show compassion to Daniel. Hold on a second. Verse 8 says, but Daniel. Verse 9 says, now God. Hold on a second. In the middle of the isolation, Daniel is looking up to God. It says, but Daniel, now God. Are you grabbing this? But Daniel, and then now God. But Daniel resolves in his heart, now God. Are, are you grabbing this? But Daniel, now God. Some of you need a, a, a but Daniel and a now God experience in your life. But, listen, you can see yourself one of three ways. You can see yourself according to how God sees you because you were created in his image, fashioned in his image. You can see yourself the way you see yourself, or you can see yourself the way others see you. And where you go from this moment forward is totally dependent upon what you train yourself, how you train yourself about who you are. You see, Daniel is coming into an assignment. Daniel leaves Israel, comes to Babylon, not of his own will. He's forced out of it. This is something that should be horrific in his life. Here is the king, Nebuchadnezzar, bringing Daniel to Babylon. He's changed his name from a Hebrew name to a Babylonian name. He's telling him what he can and cannot eat. He's training him to lose his identity as a child of God and to become a, a person who belongs to King Nebuchadnezzar. But, Daniel, hold on a second. Grab this. Daniel is coming into his assignment, and the enemy is, is using his situation to define him. But God is using it in order to refine him. Think about it. He's there, and, and Nebuchadnezzar thinks he's there to convert him into a person who's now going to be Belteshazzar, who's going to be Babylonian, but God has allowed all of this to happen so that Daniel will become a person who will ultimately help save a nation and begin to prophesy about a coming Savior in Jesus Christ. But Daniel resolved. I had this thought. It is tough for us to have resolve if we don't know who we are. If you don't know who you are, it's tough for you to have any resolve. Think about Daniel for a moment. Daniel was too Hebrew to be Babylonian for some. But now that he's given a Babylonian name, he's too Babylonian to be Hebrew for others. And so when you don't fit in with either group, you don't know who you are. And when you don't know who you are, you, you begin to take upon the identity that others have placed upon you. 
you begin to eat the garbage that the enemy is feeding you and now your identity takes up residence in who he said you were rather than who God's word says you are. Mm. How many of you know that people have a tendency to define you by the worst situations in your life? You know what I'm talking about? They tend to define you by whatever the worst situation in your life is. I mean, think about this with me for a second. Think about Saul in the New Testament. Before Paul was Paul, he was Saul. Saul was a persecutor of Christians. He murdered Christians. He had this experience with Jesus on the Damascus Road. His heart was converted, and he became Paul. If you read much in the New Testament, there's not a whole lot about Saul. I mean, we know a little bit about him, but there's not a whole lot about Saul. But there is a whole lot about Paul. In fact, two-thirds of the New Testament is written by Paul. But if church folk were writing the Bible, there'd be several books about how bad Saul was. Hello? There'd be a lot of books about how low Saul was, that Saul was a murderer, that Saul was this, Saul was that, that Saul did this and Saul did that. And there would be all kinds of books about how low he was, you know, Donnie's disaster, Timmy's tragedy. But God doesn't see you according to the mess that's in your life. God sees you through the message that he preached through Jesus Christ. God doesn't see you according to the brokenness in your life. He sees you through the finished work of Jesus Christ. God didn't see him him as Belteshazzar. He saw him as Daniel. God doesn't see you the way others see you. He sees you the way he created you. And you have been fearfully and wonderfully made is what the Bible says. So no one can tell you who you are or define you other than God. Somebody say it's training day. Listen, let me tell you something. This, this book of Daniel is not a story. It's not a book about Daniel's lowest moments. It's a book about how God is so good when Daniel was low that God showed up and made a way where there seemed to be no way. I don't know who this is for, but Facebook can't tell you who you are. You can't find out who you are through Google. It's not your job that tells you who you are. It's not your past that tells you who you are. It's not your title that tells you who you are. It's God. It's God who defines you, who designed you, who created you. Good Lord, have mercy. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, it's training day. I know some of you right now are saying, well, oh, Pastor Martin, that sounds good. And I know the Bible says that we're not to have fear. But to be honest with you, I know the Bible says that God didn't give us the spirit of fear, but he gave us, the, 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 he gave us you know, love, power, and a sound mind. But yet all I see is fear. I, I know God's word says that we have a promise, but yet it seems like the enemy only shows me my problem. I, I know God's word says that he's a provider, but it seems like everybody else tends to pass me over for that promotion. And can I tell you something? What? you are training yourself will end up robbing you of your resolve if you are not careful. It says, but Daniel and now God, but Daniel and now God, but that some of you need a now God experience. Let me go a little bit further. Moses, you are not a shepherd. That's who your father-in-law said you are. What you are is a savior of a nation. Joseph, you're not a slave. That's just what happened to you. Who you are is a provider for a nation because you will save them and you will restore them. Lord have mercy. But Daniel, now God, but Daniel, now God, but Mark, now God, but Kim, now God, but, but Alan, now God, but John, now God, but Warren, now God. Come on, somebody, help me preach in this place. Y'all making me dizzy. So here is Belteshazzar training, being trained, if you will, 
but he's not Belteshazzar. Here's Nebuchadnezzar training whom he thinks is Belteshazzar, but Belteshazzar realizes that his training comes from a greater king. And in an abstract way, you know what Daniel is doing in an abstract way? Daniel is looking up to heaven, but Daniel resolved. Daniel is praising God. Daniel is knowing, listen, there's not a whole lot worth praising God over, but I'm going to praise God anyway. Daniel's breakthrough came through his willingness to praise God in the midst of everything that he was going through. But Daniel and now God. You see, when your marriage is rough, your praise needs to be louder. When your money is funny, do we have any praisers in the house of God who will praise God because he's worth? Somebody say, now God. Some of y'all are like, well, you know, maybe not y'all, but some people are like, well, I don't like that music. That music is way too loud. I don't like it. It got all the smoke on the stage and lights, all that stuff. I just don't like that stuff. I, don't, I, I, I came for the word. I, I don't like any of that stuff. It's just not my personal preference. Aren't you glad that Jesus fought through his personal preference in the Garden of Gethsemane? I came, I came for the word. I didn't come for any of that stuff. And I just rolled up in here to get the word. I'm just a I'm word. I'm hungry for the word. Listen, can I tell you something? His word is his gift to you. Your worship is your gift to God. Some of you, hold on a second, you might not like this. Some of you come to receive the word, but how do you make a withdrawal from heaven if you've never made a deposit there? Lord have mercy. Good God Almighty. I better move on. I better move on. I better move on. Where was I at? Where was I at? Where was I at? Okay. Okay, the word, yeah, the word. Okay, so here we have, oh, listen, here, here, here's this. It's not about the position that I'm in. It's about the purpose within. Grab that. Daniel had to come to that realization in order to overcome the identity that the enemy was trying to give to him. It's not about the position I'm in. I know I should be back in Israel. I know that my family's been disrupted. I know that all of Israel's been destroyed. And I don't fully understand why I'm here, and I don't fully understand why he's calling me Belshazzar. I don't fully understand all of those things. But Daniel realized that it's not about the position that I'm in. It's about the purpose within. Let me read you something. Let me read you something. Verses 10 and following. I'm going to show you this. I'm going to show you this. Verses 10 and following. Are you there? Say, I'm there. Watch, it says, verse 10 goes on to say, But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my Lord, the king, who has assigned your food and drink. And why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would, would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. And verse 13, then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and he tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. What? I tend to think all of these other people who are around Daniel when they're watching and listening to Daniel say to this official, hey, listen, don't give us the king's food. I think some of them were like, oh, boy, you better, you're not speaking for me. I want some of that filet mignon. Daniel said, give us that food for 10 days and then, listen, and everyone was being trained and they're all watching Daniel be trained and so I had this thought I had this thought Richie come here come here Richie Richie's like every time I come up there man he makes me do something one time Richie came up he had to hold his hands up like this for 25 minutes that don't sound rough but you try to do it for 25 minutes so, so 
our brains, just stand right here, our, our brains are a complex organ. We are, I'm going to give you a biology lesson. We are complex in our nature because our God is complex and because we are fashioned in our, the image of our creator, then there are some complexities about us that are difficult, sometimes even hard to understand. But God is such a good God. He did some things for us. In fact, in our brains, at the stem, at the brain stem, there is a cluster of nerves that are called the reticular activating system. The reticular activating system, also known as the RAS, is there, this filter of nerves that grabs all of the external qualities that are around you and filters all of that information down to a level in which you can understand. It takes all of that information that is around you and filters it down to the necessary information it gets rid of all of the unnecessary information so that you can pay attention and focus on what's most important the raz if you will is the reason why you can stand in a church like this with all kinds of people looking at you all up in the balconies all in the back they're all looking at you and you can still process some thoughts right now. Like, what are you thinking right now? Don't do it. <laughs> the Raz is what gives you the ability to learn a word today. No, I'm not talking about the word of God, and that works as well, but a, a word. So you learn a word today, and all week long, you hear that word. I mean, you're watching TV, and somebody says that word, and you're like, oh. You know, the RAS is the thing that lets you drive down the road. You go to the car lot today and you say, well, I like, I like that color blue. It's just an, an off shade of blue. I like that color blue. And so I'm going to buy that car because I like that color blue. You pull off the lot. And when you drive down the road, you never saw that color blue until you went on the lot. But now that you're driving that car, it seems like everybody's got one. That's the RAS. The RAS is the thing that filters stuff so that you can focus on what is necessary and get rid of what is not necessary. The RAS is what allows you to be in a crowd, and it's, and it's so noisy, but somebody says, Richie, and you snap to attention. The RAS takes all of the information and processes it so that you can understand it. The RAS, you can create such a filter with the RAS that it will only let you process what is important to you, what is valuable to you, in order to give you the information that is valuable to you so that it can now influence your behavior. Mm. Hold on a second. So the RAS gives you the ability to grab all of this information that you have deemed to be important to you. Now, neuroscience tells us that we can train our RAS to grab the information that we want it to grab so that it influences what we need it to influence so that we can do what we need to do. So let me take it back to the Bible story. If you see yourself as belonging to Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to train yourself to be Belteshazzar. But if you see yourself belonging to God, you're going to train yourself as Daniel. Do you understand what I'm saying? You see, so you're going to lift up your hands. And there's going to be other people. Some of you, in fact, you came into this place today and you lifted up your hands and began to praise God. Even though difficulty is in your life, you know what you're training yourself? You're training yourself that no matter how bad things are greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world some of you in this place listen there were people who were watching Daniel and when they were watching Daniel Daniel was training them he didn't even realize it but they were grabbing faith they didn't have anything to worship for but they saw Daniel worshiping so they borrowed some of Daniel's faith and at the end of 10 days they looked better than they had looked before good God Almighty you see some of you maybe you don't have the energy to pray Praise God today because you're worn out. We'll sit down and watch somebody else praise God until you have the energy to stand up and say, I'm going to borrow some of your faith and I'm going to give God praise. Come on, somebody. Give him praise up in this place. Yeah. 
Everybody get up on your feet. In the end, they looked healthier. They looked healthier than the others who were eating the royal food. God was involved in this process. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, when God's with you, you look good. Uh, in fact, Look at your neighbor and say, you look like God. Now, I don't want anyone in here to get prideful and think that you're a God because that is not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that you've been created in God's image. Can I get on my soapbox for a minute? Would anyone in here ever consider cussing God out? Like, look, I'm not doing that. No. Shh, shh, lightning, no, not doing that. You wouldn't consider it. You would not consider it. But yet you look in a mirror and you tell yourself wrong things every single day. You tell yourself what's messed up about you, why people don't like you, what your insecurities are, why you don't like yourself, and you have been created in God's image, so you might as well be cussing Him. In fact, some of you, on the way home today, somebody's going to cut you off in traffic, you've been here praising God, and then all of a sudden you're going to start cussing out the person in front of you. You shouldn't have cut me off. What's wrong with you? I'm coming from church. You're trying to take my Jesus from me. I won't say any names, Christy, but, but. <laughs> but, but, but hold on a second. Listen, you, you know what the Bible says, though? The Bible says with the same tongue that you bless God with, you curse others with. I better leave that subject before uh, I make some people mad. Can, can I read you something? Can I read you something? One, one more thing, one more thing, one more thing. This is... You ever watch those shows where, and you're watching the show, and like in a break, it come, the show kind of comes back on for like 30 seconds. It's almost like a commercial, and it shows you the bonus clip. You know what I'm talking about? I'm getting ready to give you a bonus clip. Well, watch it. This is not even in your notes. I'm not charging you for it, but if you want to give an offering for it, that's great. Here's what it says. It says in verse 16 and following, it says, So the guard took away their choice food and their wine and that they were to drink, and he gave them vegetables instead. So these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, or Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all of the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Here's the bonus clip. I wrote this down this morning, not even in your notes. Before you can see the victory of God in your life and his power, you have to train yourself to see yourself in his image. Before you can see the victory of God and his power in your life, you have to train yourself to see yourself in his image. And I don't know who this is for specifically. But there's somebody in this place that you have beat yourself up over something in your life you need to understand that the grace of God is greater. The grace of God is more. And 
God will see you through. But begin to see yourself in His image. Because others have told you that you're not good enough, you're not worthy, you're not tall enough, you're not strong enough, you're not talented enough, you're too messed up, you're too this, you're too that. When they can't define who you are, God didn't see Belteshazzar. He saw Daniel. With every head bowed and every eye closed.